Hello, everybody. Okay, this is going to be a response to Nick Redding of uh, Men's Rights Edmonton. He uploaded a video titled, let me see if I can pull it up here. I am anti-feminist, that's it. And so I got permission uh, to use uh, the entire video clip of him uh, in this video. It's actually a two-part video where Fido Bogan uh, responds as well. Uh, I'm still debating whether or not I'm going to respond to Fido Bogan. It's getting a bit old. I just, you know, I just... I don't have the patience for him anymore, really. But um, Nick Redding, I think, is is honest about his position, and so I respect that. I also like his dogs in the background; very cool. Um, so yeah, I, I do want to respond to his. I think it's worth responding to his points here because I disagree. But again, I appreciate his honesty and his candor. So uh, with that said, I'm going to play for you the video right now. Uh, and basically, the video revolves around why uh, Nick Redding has chosen to adopt the label of anti-feminist, and that's all. And uh, even going as far as to say that he doesn't really care about men necessarily. He's more concerned, first and foremost, with fighting feminism. So uh, I'm going to play that for you right now, and then I'm going to respond in full. I'm not going to break the video up into parts. I think it's. I just want to play it out in full, so... You know, nobody can say that there was any out of context quote mining or anything like that. So I'm going to play his video. It's about eight minutes long, uh, his portion of the video, and then get to my portion. Ever since I started my activism, I've had feminist after feminist tell me that I'm not really interested in advancing the rights of men, but that I'm just anti feminist. They say that as though they're somehow exposing me or catching me in a lie. Uh, they say it as though it's a bad thing. I, I've never made any bones about being anti-feminist first and MRA second. Uh, I'm not exaggerating when I say that feminists are utterly incapable of sincerity and therefore do not ever argue in good faith. I'm not making this video for them. I'm making this video for various MGTOW because I've recently been hearing the same line of nonsense out of them that I've been hearing out of feminists for years. Namely, that we should stop arguing against feminism because doing so doesn't help men. It is not my intent to castigate or insult these certain MGTOW or even win them over to my way of thinking. It's just that I was recently having a conversation on Facebook with Doom Rules where he was saying something to the effect of AVFM doesn't really help men, they're just anti-feminist. When I told him that I didn't care about helping men and that my goal was just to see feminism fall into the same disrepute as racism, he responded by saying, at least you're honest about it. Now, to anyone who says that AVFM doesn't want to help men, I would direct them to anything that Dr. Terrell Palmaltier or Tom Golden has contributed to that website. I hear these certain MGTOW say that they're actually helping men by teaching them stuff. Well, Dr. Tara has definitely taught me stuff that's helped me quite a bit, and while Tom Golden's super male positive rhetoric is unappealing to me personally, he is undeniably concerned with helping men. I am not. Even when I do things to draw attention to disparities between men and women, I don't do it to improve men's lives, and I don't do it for equality because I doubt the very concept of equality. I do it to discredit feminist theory in the public square, period. To give an example, uh, before I started Men's Rights Edmonton, I did some intactivism with a young woman named Nikita Raylin Roussel. Uh, she currently runs the Intact Edmonton Facebook page, which I'll be linking to in the low bar, uh, as well as a, a male co-worker. We stood on the sidewalk of a very commercial street with shirts that read, Foreskins are awesome and handed out literature detailing the possible injuries, defects, and even death that can arise from infant male genital cutting. One man holding a toddler approached us and explained that he had gotten the procedure for his son and that he and his wife were considering it for their next child. After speaking with us, he told us that he had changed his mind. I didn't do what I did to change the law. Uh, I didn't do it for equality. Um, I didn't do it for the welfare of the little boy whose father's mind I changed. I did it to prove feminism wrong, plain, and simple. 
You see, feminism's basic premise is that women are a disadvantaged class. It's, it's a funny kind of political disadvantage that leaves one with more legal rights than those who are supposedly privileged, isn't it? Uh, rather than bickering with feminists, as some have put it, I publicly exhibited the fraud of feminism without even mentioning it by name. That I prevented a child from getting unnecessary and potentially harmful surgery was nothing more than a bonus. ABFM is not purely anti-feminist, just as Men's Rights Edmonton is not purely anti-feminist. When I listed intactivism, false allegations, and domestic violence as Men's Rights Edmonton's issues, I did not do so disingenuously. I did it because most people willing to act on those problems are also, to some degree, anti-feminist. I find fast friends among those concerned with the rights and welfare of men and boys, but I, personally, do not care about those things. I eschew altruism for the most part. As stated, I do not care about equality because I find the word itself to be little more than intellectual cotton candy. It has a certain ring to it that encompasses fairness, justice, and everything right with the world, and it's a bundle of warm and fuzzy feelings, but I encourage you, as, as a, a thought experiment, to go ask people precisely what equality is, why it's so important, and why anyone should bother fighting for it. You will almost certainly get an angry response, but I doubt you will get a rational one. This is the problem with altruism. While some are genuinely altruistic, for the most part, people just claim an interest in piety to achieve some kind of moral high ground uh, in lieu, to use in lieu of a counterpoint. Uh, while this is by no means exclusive to feminists and social justice warriors, you will virtually never find a feminist or social justice warrior this does not apply to. I'm not anti-feminist because of the harm uh, feminism undeniably does to men and boys. I'm anti-feminist because feminism is currently the mecca of compulsive liars and conformists. Am I being altruistic by opposing lies? No. I am not interested in truth for its own sake. I am interested in truth because my enemies hate it. The feminists often mock me on the basis of their own speculations that I was bullied as a kid, that I have mommy issues, that I can't get laid, etc. I am here to say that all of those charges are absolutely correct. I am and always have been something of a social outcast. Uh, while I do not place myself on the same level as Orwell and Kafka, I will say that both of them produced some of the most deeply probing literature in Western history, and they did it from the standpoint of social isolation and rejection. After my experiences in the public education system, where my lack of social graces left me feeling quite alienated and bitter towards society, I read and fell in love with 1984. I, like many others, immediately recognized the mechanisms of social control being implemented in the land of Oceania. I am not against popularity and charisma per se, I would just like these things honestly arrived at. I admit that I did not come to value honesty from a place of inner goodness, I found it by being a freak. But now that I have found it, were it a pearl and I a merchant, I would liquidate my entire inventory to possess it. Uh, in the present social climate, one must lie to be popular by repeating popular lies. One must consistently demonstrate their disdain for the truth. This is why being an outcast or a virgin or a freak is the first accusation these people come at you with. What is good is popular, and what is popular is good. In their social circles, should two people have differing points of view, the correct opinion is espoused by whoever is more popular. The only currency in determining right from wrong is one's social status. If you are uncool, nothing you say is right, and if you are cool, nothing you say is wrong. Yes, I have come here by being socially awkward, but my awkwardness does not invalidate my observations, and the hipness of my op opposition is no trump card. It has been said within the Edmonton hipster community that I am only doing this for my ego. Again, I am guilty as charged. My ego has been quite stepped on by lies told by the likes of Lise Gattel and Ryan Vanderhoek. Hammering the kinks out of these lies for all to see has been quite therapeutic as far as my ego is concerned. Uh, 
So to review, my lack of social graces left me feeling alienated and uprooted. Uh, I hated the cool kids. My hatred drove me to examine their social structure, and what I found was an artichoke of lies called feminism. Layer upon layer, I began peeling those lies down. Uh, many others are also be busy peeling away layers for their own reasons, but my reason is one big nerd revenge fantasy, and I am more than okay with that. So, more on the topic of feminist lies and peeling them back, I give you fetal bogan. All right, so let's get started here in our response. I just want to say to Nick, yes, uh, you are correct that many MGTOW do say this, and I myself have said this many times, uh, and I'll take this as an opportunity to elaborate upon exactly why MGTOW, such as myself, do say this, that, you know, it's counterproductive to just be perpetually fighting feminism over and over again uh, without uh, any end in sight, really. Now, I can only relegate to you why I say it, uh, but I'm sure that many MGTOW and many even in the manosphere in general probably share this logic to some degree. You see, we gentlemen are a fixed amount of people fighting an uphill battle against a well-funded enemy that has much more political clout than we do. Uh, this enemy has learned to leverage the female tendency to portray herself as a victim and the male tendency to perceive and defend women as victims. One of the feminist establishment's most potent maneuvers, I think, is to maneuver those who oppose them into constant, never-ending dialogue in which slowly, but surely, may start with your points and issues that you might want addressed, you know, male circumcision or false rape accusations or prostate cancer research and funding. Uh, that's the conversation you may start with. But in bickering with feminists long enough, you will have found that at the end of the conversation with feminists or social justice warriors in general, that the focus slowly but surely makes its way back to female victimhood and what we should be doing about that. So although at times it most certainly is effective to argue against feminist ideology, there exists a point where if you're not careful, a skillful feminist, and by the way, uh, Nick, I don't buy this meme we have in the men's movement that feminists are, you know, stupid and incapable of reason mimetic. I think that feminists, a great many of them, are intelligent skilled at political discourse and understanding of where and when they have an advantage over MRAs. But a skillful feminist will maneuver the conversation towards some sort of female victimhood and before you even know what's happening, she'll do this. And this is why feminists like Anita Sarkeesian are so successful. This is why Gamergate has failed and will continue to fail because even though the initial purpose of Gamergate was to bring attention to feminist incursions into gaming and gaming journalism, and to point out censorship and the authoritarian agenda they were pushing, Anita Sarkeesian need only say the words death threat and everybody flipped their shit. And over time, it took a while, but over time, right? And if you really think about it, you'll be able to reach this conclusion as well. Over time, even Gamergate has fizzled out for the most part, despite uh, a trivial advertising victory here and there, which I congratulate them for, but it is trivial in the grander sense. Anita Sarkeesian, however, is as successful as ever, and Gamergators are still, to this day, trying to stave off the never-ending procession of misogynist stigma because they didn't understand that at a certain point, one must stop being perceived as bickering with the likes of feminists and one must begin to be perceived as moving along and attempting to achieve something. And this is a delicate line that has to be walked and knowing how to navigate that line correctly and knowing when to disengage from feminists and use that momentum you've built discrediting them in order to parlay that into an actual achievement. That's an important skill to know. If you're perceived as arguing with feminists simply because you do not like feminists, even if you don't like feminists for all the right and obvious reasons, you will be perceived eventually as not liking and even attacking women. This is so because as much as some MRAs don't want to admit this, there is a Rubicon point in our society's consciousness in which the words feminist and the word women, for all intents and purposes, are considered to be the same thing. If you bicker and argue with feminists perpetually and you are perceived as those guys who argue with feminists and nothing else, then you're perceived as hostile to women whether you are or not. And feminists, such as Anita Sarkeesian, and feminists in general know this and are exploiting MRA technology uh, with that very fact because they know that MRA technology is fundamentally flawed in terms of its need to make a distinction, a perpetual distinction between the Western woman and the feminist establishment, and women in general even. Women and the feminist establishment are not parallel lines that never touch, but lines that do intersect and converge after intersection 
And so MRA technology is suffering from a guidance system that can be misdirected to splash comfortably in the ocean far, far away from their feminist targets, rendering them ineffective no matter the strength of their payload. This is why the internet aristocrat ran out of things to talk about, essentially. And this is why Thunderfoot, who I'm, who I'm a huge fan of, right? I'm not bashing Thunderfoot at all. But this is why, for all of his efforts against Anita Sarkeesian, he's now greeted uh, in his comment section with a non-trivial segment of his comment section every time he uploads a new Sarkeesian video, whining with, you know, oh, not another Sarkeesian video. When are we going to get back to the science protest, right? This complaint. So essentially, if you bash Anita Sarkeesian long enough, then she gets exactly what she wants. The appearance of victimhood. Of course, also, she's a female. So by default, our society is going to look at her more as the victim, right? So there is there is a social inertia that you have to overcome just to get on equal footing because people are more likely to perceive somebody like Anita Sarkeesian as a victim than Thunderfoot as a victim. You see, MRAs, if they wish to be successful, are going to have to become well acquainted with this female slash feminist Rubicon and learn how to steer away from it when they're getting too close and steer towards it when they're getting too far. And failure to learn this skill will result in what we see in many sectors of the men's rights movement today already. And this is typified by equal parts overzealous urge to root out and find, quote, misogynist male offenders uh, for female and feminist approval coupled with an obsessive need to argue perpetually with feminists to the point where nothing else matters but that, and where no time is left over to actually secure male rights. And I think it's important to say this, but the original intention of the men's rights movement, and what should always be the intention of the men's rights movement, first and foremost, is securing the rights of men. You don't get to call yourself a men's rights movement if your only goal is to bash feminists, even if they deserve to be bashed. Metaphorically speaking, not physically, of course, they're going to say before somebody says I'm threatening violence. Now, as to your reference of uh, Shrink for Men and Tom Golden's work, uh, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with their work, so I'm not going to comment on them since I haven't uh, sufficiently read either of them. Uh, but as far as equality is concerned, I do not believe that I know of a single MGTOW that advocates for the definition of equality that would have men and women achieve complete parity with each other in all ways, since, as you've just said, such a thing is impossible. What MGTOW would like to see, however, is equal treatment under the law, meaning if women get domestic violence shelters, then men get domestic violence shelters, or neither gets any. Now, in terms of your intactivism, well, you know, good for you, good on you. Uh, circumcision is an important issue. Mutilating boys is unacceptable. It needs to stop, period. So I applaud your work. Uh, I absolutely do. Uh, but I have to ask, what exactly did your intactivism do to discredit feminism? From my understanding, and perhaps I'm wrong on this, so anyone feel free to correct me, but the feminist role in the circumcision debate, as far as I can tell, has always been, from what I've observed, uh, an attempt to focus more on female circumcision and to portray it as worse than male circumcision. In fact, you say that the entire activism was performed without even mentioning feminism, which would make your activism solely focused on portraying circumcision as wrong and unsafe without ever disreputing a single feminist. And I, in my opinion, this is the type of pro-male activism I want to see. The type that spends zero time talking about feminists and that just says why circumcision, for example, is wrong. Because it is wrong. Cut the feminists out of the conversation completely. Ignore them as they should be ignored. And reply to them only when absolutely necessary. Uh, right? A simple Google search for the feminist stance on circumcision uh, revealed to me uh, many feminists, including the much reviled Jessica Valenti, that at the very least claim to be anti-male circumcision. So I see no reason why a men's rights activist advocating against circumcision should give so much undeserved attention at all to feminists in the process when feminists can easily just point to supposed examples of feminists and activists and say, see, you know, you're wrong about feminists. All you care about is demonizing us. Now, do I think feminists really care about male circumcision? No. But if you really intend on fighting feminism, you have to do this strategically. You can't give them undue attention, and you can't ascribe things to them that they can publicly get away with denying. And of course, there's nothing wrong as far as I'm concerned with uh, discrediting feminists. But if you approach it in this manner, it's only a matter of time before they use that to switch the conversation to being about them. Cut them out of the conversation so they can't do that. 
And when you do have to talk about them, make sure it's at the minimum level so they can't switch the conversation to them. Make sure that when people confront the MRA, that they come away with a distinct feeling that this person is concerned first and foremost with securing male rights. Make sure that that is the impression that you leave as an MRA. In regards to the issue of intactivism, feminists are insignificant. Thus, we relegate them to insignificance. We conserve the social inertia and momentum that we build surrounding activism, or in this case, intactivism, and we don't squander it away by allowing feminists to redirect that social inertia into something that's about them or about women, which again, as I've said, after a certain amount of time, bickering with feminists will become the same things. Now, you say that you didn't do this intactivism for equality or for the welfare of infant boys, etc., but you instead did it to prove feminism wrong. And again, that's fine. Uh, but one has to wonder how this differs from someone calling themselves a civil rights activist at the height of the civil rights movement, telling blacks, for example, that he doesn't care about blacks. He only cares about making the KKK look bad. People are naturally going to assess that statement as, you know, well, this guy isn't really our ally. If it ever got to the point where the discrediting of the KKK ran counter to the interests of civil rights activists, then he wouldn't only not be our ally, but he would be a self-professed enemy. And this precisely is what I was trying to warn MRAs about in the video where I responded to Stone, and I'll play that video, that clip of the video, uh, right here. It would actually be beneficial to men. You see, I don't, call, I don't call it the men's movement anymore, or the men's rights movement anymore. Because I think the appropriate term is now the anti-feminist movement, because at this point, the key descriptive term for the so-called men's rights movement is anti-feminism. Bickering with feminists takes precedence over men and men's issues. At least currently they do. You see, right now, the men's rights movement has adopted this kind of uh, dichotomy-based great evil versus great good, nuanceless position. And let me give you an example of how the men's rights movement has slowly morphed into the ineffective sticking it to Tumblr and Twitter feminist movement. An example of this is how the men's rights organization CAFE placed an award for the arrest and conviction of the MRA that some feminist said crept up on her in the dark of night and, you know, punched her or assaulted her or whatever. Now look at what's being done here. It's so important to these people to tarnish feminism that they're willing to place men at risk in doing so in a supposed movement for men and boys. And don't get me wrong, I understand what they were trying to achieve in doing this. I understand that they were banking on the attack being manufactured. I know they were depending on the fact that feminists tend to manufacture male aggression for attention and financial gain in victimology, right? So they put the reward up, speculating that no one would collect it based on the likely behavior of feminists, or should I say a likely behavior of feminists that manufactures victimhood. So I know very well what they were trying to achieve. I know what they were banking on. And I also know that another likely feminist behavior, and I'm sure this came up during the conversation surrounding the decision to post this reward, at least if these MRAs were worth their salt, another likely behavior is the framing of men and falsely accusing men of crimes they didn't commit and having them tossed in jail, even though they're innocent. And so the people who posted this reward must have decided then that it's an acceptable risk to provide a financial incentive for feminists to falsely accuse a man of assault an assault they believe didn't even occur. They had to consider the fact that feminists could have said, okay, these MRAs are posting a reward. Let's just say that it was this poor smuck who did it, right? Who cares? He's a man, he's an oppressor anyway, right? And all to do what? All to do what? Score a blow against feminists? That's what it comes to, isn't it? The men's movement cares more about sticking it to feminists than they do about men. And if in the process of sticking it to feminists, we have to risk some innocent men, then who cares? Because like the cultural Marxist conspiratards, the men's rights movement has adopted feminism as their Kralizek, their typhoon struggle that everybody and anything is worth sacrificing to. It's a religion. I want you to read this comment by a subscriber of mine in response to my posting a video where I... My advice to MRAs is simply this. Don't allow yourselves to be defined by your anti-feminism. Don't become the next atheism, which has become essentially a one-trick pony defined by its anti-Christianity or anti-religion uh, stance. Right? They've become so obsessed with this anti-religious stance and have defined themselves so much by it that they fail to see another fundamentalist religion 
the religion of feminism infiltrating them and ruining their movement with their atheism plus bullshit. The same thing can happen with the Manosphere. They can become so focused on anti-feminism that traditionalists or PUAs being allowed to steer the narrative as long as, you know, they're not feminist, right? Anti-feminism is now a gimmick. Don't be that gimmick along with it. Beating the Christian dead horse is atheism's gimmick now, and they've so focused on that that they couldn't recognize feminist incursions to their spaces until it was too late. Don't let anti-feminism become the men's rights movement's gimmick. No one is saying that they shouldn't be opposed, but not at the cost of allying ourselves with all manner of misandrists and gynocentrists and PUA pussy beggars and tradcon infiltrators. And of course, the men's rights movement is free to court as many of these tradcons or PUAs as they like, but understand that these groups are antithetical to what MGTOW are about, and you court these people at the cost of your allegiance or alliances with MGTOW. No, no, I'm not speaking for MGTOW as some leader, but as someone who understands what the vast majority of MGTOW are likely to do. Now you ask in this video to define equality and why it's worth fighting for, and I'll define it right here and now. Equality is a condition specifically relating to legal status in which all peoples are afforded the same general standard of treatment under the law. So for example, no one group should receive special treatment, not blacks, not whites, not men, not women, etc. And that is in fact worth fighting for. Now you say you're not anti-feminist because of the harm they undeniably cause to men, but because feminism is currently the mecca of compulsive liars and conformists, I disagree. I think that feminists are far from the only aspect of or group in our society known for these characteristics, uh, right? Evangelical Christians, traditionalists, and their bullshit morality crusading, uh, LGBT hypocrites, liberal poverty pimps, racist right-wing whack jobs, right? There exists literally a plethora of meccas of groups that exhibit the tendency to lie compulsively in furtherance of their own agendas. And frankly, I don't even know if feminists are even the worst of the bunch. They're bad, no doubt, but there's plenty of other groups in society lining up to make men just another version and another form of what they've always been. Another version of society's oxen, another version of society's pincushion. You say that in the present climate, one must lie to be popular by repeating popular lies. Well, that, uh, my friend Nick Redding, is precisely what MGTOW are trying to tell some of these MRAs, that we can't afford to gain our popularity by repeating a popular lie. That is, that feminism is the main and only cause of the problems men are facing today. You say that feminists come at MRAs with accusations of being a virgin, right, or a social outcast. Take a look at Aaron Clary's recent videos, right, and many other MRAs to see that same exact rhetoric directed at MGTOW, which is proof positive that it doesn't only come from feminists and is proof positive as well that sometimes it even comes directly from the manosphere. So I'll be talking more about this, but uh, that's all for now. More content to come.